Hey, welcome back. We're taking a little detour through the twin prime conjecture. We'll get back to 3n plus 1 soon. Chalk this up to general education about how numbers work. The twin prime conjecture says there's an infinite number of primes that are two apart. Nobody knows if this is true. It's possible there's some final pair of twin primes out there. Uh, empirically, you can plot how many twin primes there are from 1 to x for any x. It flattens out over time as the twin primes become more and more rare. The $64,000 question is whether the graph ever flatlines completely. One idea is to draw two smooth, well understood curves like this and this and prove that um, pi 2 of x is always between these curves. If the bottom curve were always increasing, like square root of x or something, then we know the twin prime curve could never flatline. The Norwegian Vigo Brun made a proof for a top curve. He said the number of twin primes between 1 and x can't exceed such and such. Kind of a speed limit for how fast the twin primes keep rolling in. Uh, it's hard to grapple, though, with how many twin primes there are unless we first grapple with how many regular primes there are. So that's the topic for today. Uh, here's an empirical plot of the number of primes between 1 and x. It also tapers off. From here to here, half the numbers are prime. From here to here, a third of them are. And from here to here, a fourth of them are. Euclid showed that there's an infinite number of primes. And we can turn his proof into a stronger statement that pi of x is greater than such and such for all x. OK, Euclid's proof is basically a factory that spews out primes. First, pretend that 2 and 3 are the only primes. Now multiply 2 by 3 and add 1. That's 7, which isn't divisible by 2 because it's 1 more than a multiple of 2, and also isn't divisible by 3. It's 1 more than a multiple of 3. So 7 is either prime or it's divisible by some prime other than 2 or 3. In any case, the Euclid factory has just generated some new prime. Now take 2 times 3 times 7 plus 1 equals 43. That's not divisible by 2 or 3 or 7, so 43 is yet another new prime or a multiple of a new prime. So we can say that in the range from 1 to 43, there are at least 4 primes. Actually, there are a lot more primes, like 5 and 11, so we're undercounting, but that's okay. Now take 2 times 3 times 7 times 43 plus 1, which is 1807, not prime itself, but uh, it has a prime factor of 13. So in the range from 1 to 1807, we can confirm at least five primes. Now, these ranges are all over the place, so we're not yet able to say pi of x is greater than such and such for all x. So let's go back to the top. Instead of saying that these two primes are in the range of 1 to 3, well, it's also true that they're in the range of 1 to 4. And uh, when we multiply them together to get 7, we're multiplying two numbers less than or equal to 4, so it's true that these three primes are now in the range 1 to 16. And multiplying 2 times 3 times 7 is at most multiplying 4 times 4 times 16, or 256. So even though the next prime is only 43, we can safely say it's in the range 1 to 256. And now we're in good shape, uh, because between 1 and x, there are at least k primes, where k is the log of the log of x plus 1. Now, that's super conservative. There are surely a lot more primes than that. But no matter what monstrously large x you give me, I can tell you with absolute certainty there are at least log log x primes less than x. Can we do better than Euclid? Yes, the mathematician Paul Ordish did better. He said, suppose there's k primes. How many numbers from 1 to 100 can we construct using those k primes? First, Erdos pointed out that every number in the universe can be constructed as the product of distinct primes times a square. For example, 360, uh, which can be rearranged as 2 times 5 times 6 squared. Using our k primes, there are 2 to the k ways to make products out of them. Now, the squares are infinite, but only squares up to 10 are useful if we want to construct numbers from 1 to 100. So we have 2 to the k times 10 total ways to construct a number. And here are some of them. Now to be able to construct all numbers from 1 to 100, we need 2 to the k times 10 to be greater than 100, or 2 to the k greater than uh, 10, or k greater than or equal to 4. So there are at least 4 primes from 1 to 100, and we can say that for sure without even having to identify any of the 4 primes. And in general, we have 2 to the k square root of x greater than x 
Um, and so pi of x is greater than half of log x, which is a lot better than Euclid's log log x. The lesson from Erdos is that you need enough primes to be able to construct the non-primes. But the primes can't be too numerous because each prime brings with it a boatload of non-primes. For example, once we say 2 is a prime, that means 4, 6, 8, 10, etc. are not primes. That means already only half the numbers even have a chance to be prime, so pi of x is less than half of x. Actually, less than half of x plus 1 because we got to keep 2 itself in the prime mix. This is the first step in the sieve of Eratosthenes. Cross out all the multiples of 2 except 2. Second step is to cross out all the multiples of 3 except 3. Notice now we're left with just 1 third x numbers that might be primes. So we can say pi of x is less than about 1 third of x. Now we previously said pi of x is greater than log of x, so now we're coming at it from both sides. This sieve idea is connected to Vigo Brun and the twin primes, so we're going to save it for later. Spoiler alert, sieving out the first log x primes gives us this, and the proof works without even knowing what those primes are. Okay, our bounds so far are pretty bad. Everybody knows there's way more than four primes between 1 and 100. Luckily, Chebyshev and Erdos did better. So x over log x is basically x divided by the number of digits in x, which is way more accurate. Their idea is to consider all the primes uh, up to 2x. So suppose x is 4 and 2x is 8. Uh, here we make a product out of all the primes between x and 2x. That's 5 and 7. And here we take the primes between 1 and 2x and raise each of them to the highest power that keeps them uh, under 2x. So with these two special numbers, we can prove the bounds. And the proof doesn't care about what the numbers actually are, uh, but I'm going to use the actual numbers here so we can see how it works. Each of these numbers here uh, are bigger than x, so this product is bigger than x to the number of primes between x and 2x. And each of these numbers is smaller than 2x. So this product is smaller than 2x to the number of primes up to 2x. Now to connect our two special numbers, we're going to put this fancy guy in the middle. It's 2x choose x, which is an integer. And it turns out this fancy guy is a multiple of this, so it's bigger. Because if we take out the primes, what's left is still an integer. And this is a multiple of the fancy guy for a slightly more complicated reason. And finally, the fancy guy itself is bigger than 2 to the x because each of these x little ratios is bigger than 2. And it's less than 2 to the 2x because rearranging here, uh, each of these 2x little ratios is smaller than 2. Okay, that's the whole picture, and we can easily get the two bounds from it. For the first bound, um, x to the pi of 2x minus pi of x is less than 2 to the 2x. So we get this, which is a general formula, which gives us these facts. And we can cross these out and use general induction to show uh, that the right-hand side never gets bigger than 5x over log x. And we can get the second bound from this part. Um, this is also a general formula, so pi of x is greater than a half of x log x. And done. Only a few people know this proof. Okay, so is that the limit of our understanding of the primes? No. Mathematicians have tightened this up further to something like this now. And the 160-year-old Riemann hypothesis would give something like this, which is super tight around the empirical data. And at that point, who cares about the empirical data? It's like, this is how the primes work. But despite a million dollar bounty, no one has proven the Riemann hypothesis yet. So hey, if you're looking for another get rich slow scheme, uh, it might be right up your alley. Okay, see you next time.